Good morning. Welcome this morning. It is good to see you here and to be able to enjoy the nice, fresh fall weather, isn't it? And, uh, and to be able to uh, come together and to worship in the Lord's presence this morning. A couple of things I just want to highlight for you as the uh, worship team comes forward. Uh, first of all, we've got uh, next Sunday is actually Thanksgiving Sunday. It, uh, it feels like it comes a little bit early this year, but... Uh, uh, because it's really the first Sunday of the month, but it's actually the second Monday, so that's why it's uh, next Sunday. Uh, so your Thanksgiving letters went out in the mail this past week. If you haven't gotten them yet, hopefully you'll get them sometime this week. Uh, you'll have a Thanksgiving envelope in there, and you can see details in the letter about what the Thanksgiving uh, gift is going to this year. But next Sunday, being also the first Sunday, is Communion Sunday. And on Communion Sunday, we always collect for the food bank as well. And so next week, it's gonna be a little bit different. Usually when you bring stuff in for the food bank, you'll leave it in a box out in the back entryway. What we'd like you to do is to actually bring it with you to your pew and keep it, and then during the service, we're going to actually have it displayed up front. Am I got that right, correct, Marilyn? Yes. Yes, okay. Yes, we so, will, there will be a point in the service when you'll have the opportunity to bring it forward. Yeah. To present so it. bring all your food bank stuff next week and then we'll have an opportunity to bring it forward as an offering to the Lord uh, during part of the service next week and also during the service next week the Bolivia team is going to be sharing about their experiences so you'll want to come and, and hear about those and some of the thankful things that are some of the things we're thankful for about their mission this past uh, past August or September earlier this month anyway uh, secondly, if you weren't here last Sunday and you missed the opportunity to get some free books, they are still available. The library downstairs has uh, been overstocked and so they're getting rid of some of their stock. So it's, you just travel the hallway downstairs, you'll see lots of books there and help yourself to them. If you want to leave a donation for the library, you can do that, but uh, please just help yourself uh, to those books. And what we don't actually... Uh, hand out through our own congregation, we're going to pass off to some other churches that may have need of that. Uh, Tuesday nights, we're doing a, a, a small group study, as it were, on our neighborhood and taking a look at uh, Fredericton and what it's like and, and what opportunities there are for us to be able to minister in uh, this community. And this is really important as we look towards uh, staffing in the future. And, uh, and so if you want to have a part of of uh, seeing what there is around, but also helping to shape what there's going to be. Uh, join us Tuesday evening at seven o'clock, and, uh, and this week in particular, uh, bring some footwear that uh, you can uh, walk around in a little bit, because we're gonna do a little bit of walking this particular week. And then finally, uh, we also, I know, because I have heard people bragging about their bowling scores, and just how awesome they are at bowling, and I know that there are some of us who are regulars at it, we actually have a bowl-a-thon coming up on uh, October the uh, 13th, uh, and it's going to be at the Bowl-a-drome. So you, I know some of you go out to Kingswood, so this will be an opportunity to try a different lane, see if you're just as good in, in a different spot. And uh, it's a fundraiser for the uh, Philippine team, Philippine Scent team. And so you can find details of it in the bulletin. There's sponsor sheets. We'd like you to get sponsors. And those are available at the kiosk. And, um, and you can pick it up, and there's information there for you as well. I think those are all the things that I wanted to highlight this morning. We'll let the worship team take over. I invite you to stand, please. And we'll read together our call to worship from Nehemiah 9, verse 5. Stand up and bless the Lord your God, who is from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, and may it be exalted above all blessings and praise.
Our God gives us strength. He is the powerful, almighty, eternal God. Darkness. 
Our God, this morning, we come into your presence knowing that you are a great and powerful God, that you are in control of all things, and that you have given us life, and that we can hold on to you because you are our anchor. We are assured that we, are, we can trust in you this morning. You are good. You are oh so good, God. So good to us, this beautiful world in which we live, the riches and the wealth that we have, and the wonders of your love for us. Draw us into your presence this morning. Fill us with your spirit. Help us to grow closer to you in all things that are done here today. May glorify you. Touch our minds, we pray, and our hearts. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray these things. Amen. Before you're seated, I invite you to greet those who are worshiping nearby. Good morning, and isn't it wonderful to be able to greet our family? This morning, uh, is this re This morning, the Bible reading is from Jeremiah 1, 4 through 10. You can find it in your pew Bible on page 731, or follow along on the screen. The call of Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and, I said, and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word.
choir. And indeed, it is good to be able to come into the house of the Lord and to worship Him and to adore Him. And as we come, the psalmist says, as we come into the house of the Lord, bring gifts and offerings to Him. And so, too, we bring an offering unto the Lord to rejoice and to praise His name. Let us uh, dedicate these to the Lord as uh, we do. Let us pray. Father our God, we give you thanks this day for your blessings. We give you thanks this day that we can come together in your house in great freedom. And Lord, as we do, we ask that you would uh, accept these gifts, these offerings, and these tithes for your kingdom, for your blessing, for your glory. And we ask these things in Christ's name. you fit two people on a bench, um, that's a little difficult, and I don't know how they do it with four hands going all over the keyboard, but uh, that was lovely. Thank you very much. How Great Thou Art. What a beautiful song. And I think of that song so much this time of the year, because when you look out uh, and you see the wonderful world that God has made and the beauty that surrounds us, we are going to sing a hymn. And as we sing this hymn, I'm going to invite the children to come up to the front for a moment with the pastor. And we're going to sing the first two and the fourth verses, so that's three verses, of Trust and Obey. Let's stand together as we sing.
seated. Good morning. Oh my word, are you awake? Good morning. Thank you. I, I'm not, at least one of you is awake, so I appreciate that. Good. Um, are, are any of you scared of anything? Is there anything that frightens you or that you are afraid of? No? Spiders? Mice? Big dogs? Thunder? No? Wow, you're pretty fearless people then. So, there was a time, what about being alone? You ever afraid that you'll be all by yourself? No? Jesus' disciples were worried about that. Jesus had been with them for three years, and he'd been teaching and healing, and he was always with them. They were always with him. And all of a sudden, Jesus started telling them one night that he was going to go away. And they were saying, what? Where are you going? And he said, people are going to arrest me, and, I might be, and I'm going to be crucified. And they thought, oh my word, what's going to happen? And they became very afraid. This was actually the very night before Jesus died that he was talking to his disciples. And so he said to his disciples, peace I'm giving you, and I leave it with you. Now, peace is about having a calmness in your spirit, about feeling whole and right. Then Jesus said, don't be anxious, don't let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. And I think that phrase, do not be afraid, is one of God's favorite phrases, because he uses it all over the place. He tells Moses that, he told Jeremiah that, he told Mary that, he tells his disciples that. Here's the reason why they don't need to be afraid. He says, because I am always with you, even to the very end of the world. Do you know that you're never alone? Because God is always with you. Jesus is always with you. And if Jesus is always with you, then you never have to be afraid of being alone. Just like those disciples. I don't know if they learned it right away, but eventually they did, because they knew that Jesus was always with them. And I want you to remember that this morning as well, that you're never by yourself, because God is always with you, and uh, God always wants to be a part of you. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you this day that you love us so deeply and that you want to give of yourself to us and you have given your son in our place so that we can be with you always, even here and now. We ask this and we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Good. So you can follow your teachers out. Between the hot and the cold, somewhere between the new and the old, somewhere between who I am and who I used to be, somewhere in the middle, you'll find me. Somewhere between the wrong and the right Somewhere between the darkness and the light Somewhere between who I was and who you're making me Somewhere in the middle you'll find me Just how close can I get, Lord, to my surrender without losing all control? Fearless warriors in a picket fence, reckless abandon wrapped in common sense, 
deep water faith in the shallow end but we are caught in the middle with eyes wide open to the differences the god we want and the god who is but will we trade our dreams for his or are we caught in the Waves somewhere between a whisper and a roar, somewhere between the altar and the door, somewhere between contented peace and always wanting more, somewhere in the middle you'll find me. Just how close can I get, Lord, to my surrender without losing all control? Fearless warriors in a picket fence, reckless abandon wrapped in common sense, deep water faith in the shallow end, and we are caught in the middle. With eyes wide open to the differences, the God we want and the God who is. But will we trade our dreams for His, or are we caught in the middle? And I know you're by my side, loving me even on these nights. When I'm caught in the middle, Thank you, Alex. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for the opportunity to come here and gather together in your name. We know that there are many around the world who do not get to partake in that uh, privilege, those who have to meet in secret or those who are persecuted for their beliefs. We thank you for their courage, Lord, their dedication and I pray that they will know that their brothers and sisters around the world are lifting them up in prayer right now. Lord, we thank you for the change of season, for the beautiful colors in the trees, and especially for the reminder that though everything in this world changes, you stay steadfast. You are everlasting. Your love knows no end. You are the same God yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And because of that, we have nothing to fear. Lord, we lift up Betty and Betty Ann and Jerry Taylor, who are going through a particularly rough time right now. We um, lift our condolences to them. I pray that you will wrap them in your loving arms, Lord. Lord, we think of all of those in our congregation who aren't able to be with us we pray that they will know that they are loved and missed, and I pray that you will put your healing hand upon them, give them strength and peace for each new day. And Lord, we think of all the people around the world who are um, suffering and in danger because of natural disasters, tsunamis, earthquakes, floods, landslides. I pray that each of us will find in our heart a way to 
help them, whether that be through prayer or by financial aid. I pray that we will never lose sight of our brothers and sisters around the world who are not as fortunate as us, and that we will always seek to do what we can to show your love to each and every person that we meet. We think of our neighbors and our own communities, Lord, all the times we overlook them, uh, and we pray that you will open our eyes to see ways that we can encourage them, and that we can help the widows and orphans in their distress. Lord, we pray now as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our uh, second scripture this morning is uh, actually just a continuation of the first scripture. We're going to keep going through Jeremiah chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 11 to 19, really the end of the chapter. The word of the Lord came to me, what do you see, Jeremiah? I see the branch of an almond tree, I replied. The Lord just said to me, you have seen correctly, for I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled. The word of the Lord came to me again, what do you see? I see a boiling pot tilting away from the north, I answered. The Lord said to me, from the north, disaster will be poured out on all who live in the land. I am about to summon all the peoples of the northern kingdoms, declares the Lord. Their kings will come and set up their thrones at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem. They will come against her, like, they will come against all her surrounding walls and against all the towns of Judah. I will pronounce my judgments on my people because of their wickedness in forsaking me and burning incense to other gods, and worshiping what their hands have made. Get yourself ready. Stand up. And say to them whatever I command you. Do not be terrified by them, or I will terrify you before them. Today I have made you a fortified city, an iron pillar, and a bronze wall to stand up against the whole land, against the kings of Judah and its officials, its priests, and the peoples of the land. They will fight against you, but will not overcome you. For I am with you, and I will rescue you, declares the Lord. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Have you ever been afraid? You ever been afraid? Have you ever had a... What, what was the moment of your greatest fear when you were most afraid? For me, I think it would be the summer of 1987. 1987. That summer, I was working in Moncton for my summer job, and Lisa was working in Dorchester, which, if you know those, are about a half hour apart, maybe a little bit less, so forth. This is 1987, so you need to remember that back then, this is before the Twin Highway, in case you uh, like, don't remember 1987 at, at all, or uh, don't remember New Brunswick in 1987, the highway now between Moncton and Sackville, uh, which you go to Sackville and go to Dorchester today, is divided. But back then it was just, just a single highway uh, through there. And back then, in the summer of 1987, I was driving my first car. It was a 1979 Volkswagen Rabbit. Does anybody remember those? No, I'll say a few of you. Okay, something like that. Mine was a, a lime green Volkswagen, 1979 Volkswagen Rabbit. So it's about eight or nine years old. I say lime green. It was probably more like lima bean green. And uh, if you were asking my girlfriend at the time, she probably would have said it was more like puke green, but that's okay. It was, uh, it was my first car, and I was very proud of it and, and, and so forth. 
little four-cylinder hatchback, if that helps you, if you don't know what they are, stuff like that. And so, of course, Lisa's in Dorchester. I'm in Moncton. A lot of weekends. I would travel down to Dorchester for a day or so. It's pretty easy to get there just to visit. And when she had time off from her job, she was working in a museum that summer and, and so forth. And on one evening in particular, uh, I had driven down with my best friend, and uh, Lisa and her housemate, uh, Brenda was her name, uh, was, made us dinner, made us supper. We had supper with them, and then after supper, Bruce and I uh, traveled back to Moncton. And as we were going along the highway, we come to that place just after Memram Cook, and there's that steep hill that goes up, there's a big quarry or something off to the side there, if you know it, the train bridge goes by, if you know that, you know that area very well. And as I get there, in those days, it was, it was a single highway, but going up the hill was a passing lane, which was very convenient because there was a transport truck in front of me as we were going. So I pull out into the passing lane that starts at the bottom of the hill uh, to pass this transport truck in my little 1979 Volkswagen four-cylinder rabbit going up a big hill. And I get out, and I get beside the transport truck, but, but somehow he doesn't seem to slow down as he goes up the hill, and I can't seem to speed up as I'm going up the hill. And so we're getting to the top of the hill, and I'm still like right beside in the middle of this transport truck. And all of a sudden, we're at the top of the hill, and the passing lane is no longer there. And I'm still beside this transport truck, and another transport truck is coming the opposite direction, straight towards us. And I don't know exactly what happened at that moment. I just kind of remember holding my hands very tight as I straddled the yellow line, trying to go straight ahead. I think I kept my eyes open as we were going. But thinking, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. We're going to die. My best friend's sitting beside. I don't look at him at all. Nobody says anything. We actually stop our conversation. Nobody says anything while we're going. And I don't know how it happened, but I'm in the middle on, the, on this yellow line, and the transport truck is beside me, and the other one goes right, and we straddle between these two transport trucks and this little Volkswagen rabbit at that moment. And I don't know if we talked at all the rest of the way back to Moncton. <laughs> it was terrifying. Here, years later, we never talked about it that night, but years later, I'm recounting this story, and Bruce is sitting there with me. And Bruce remembers it very well. And he says to me, or in the midst of this conversation, he says, I think... And I always have looked back on that moment as God saved my life for a purpose. I knew at that moment that God had saved my life, so he must have a plan for me. And there must be some kind of calling on my life. Otherwise, I, I should have died that night between those two transport trucks. As we looked at Jeremiah last week, we saw God call him. We talked about that call. We're, we're looking at Jeremiah. We're looking at Jeremiah who had confidence in the midst of the cha most chaotic time there was in Israelite history. And uh, some of the most greatest turmoil in Israelite history. And Jeremiah, God calls him to be a prophet in the midst of all of this. And he's chosen. We looked last week at, at his confidence that came because he had that surety of that inner call in his life. And that call brought him confidence. But God wasn't finished with Jeremiah yet in this calling process. He, he instilled in him that sense of call that would abide with him and hold him through. But Jeremiah, after he has this call, God needs to address within him some fears. Because he has some anxiety, even in the midst of it all. And there's nothing that will cause more chaos in your own life than living with fear. When you're confronted by your fears, the things that you worry about the most, the things that are concerning to you, and it might not be, most of the time maybe it's not physical life, maybe it's financial health, or maybe it's an embarrassing situation that you don't want anybody to know about. Or, but when we live in fear... 
It can paralyze us. It can be like stuck to the steering wheel just hoping you can squeeze through it all somehow. Or it could make us very irritable and we could start to lash out at the people that we love and the people who could support us through those midst of those fears. Or we could become very anxious, stressed, start to do wrong things to try and resolve whatever the situation is. When we looked at Jeremiah last week, we saw he was just a, a kid from the little village of Anoth outside of Jerusalem. And God calls him to be a prophet. A prophet to the nations. This is a huge call for Jeremiah. He is called to be something greater than he is. Something more. God is calling him to step up into the spotlight and to be more than he is at that moment. And a prophet was no small calling. Prophet's job is to let people know who God is and what God is like and to speak the words of the Lord to the people. A prophet comes and he challenges our complacency and he calls us to action. Prophet could anger us by confronting our hypocrisy or revealing our selfishness or putting our sins out there in the open for all to see. Prophet can make things that we think are unimportant seem very important because God loves all people. And beyond their words, prophets were men and women who had to embody the message. It wasn't just that they spoke the message, they had to live it or be hypocrites. So a prophet had to have the words of God, speak the words of God, but then they had to practice what they preached. Jeremiah knew all about prophets. He had read a few prophets. He had seen a few prophets. He knew a, a prophetic life was going to be a huge demand upon him. That God was calling him to be more than he was. And Jeremiah felt inadequate. I have called you to be a prophet to the nations, thus saith the Lord. And Jeremiah says, ah, uh, Lord... Are you sure you're talking to the right guy? Because I do not know how to talk very well, and I'm just a kid. I am but a child. No one's going to listen to me. I'm too young and too tongue-tied. They'll laugh at me. They'll tell me to go away. You need someone, Lord, who is older and more well-respected and more eloquent than I. Jerah begins to offer his excuses. Excuses that we have heard before. Do you remember Moses standing in front of the burning bush? The Lord says, I'm sending you to my people. And Moses' first words are, who am I? I'm a nobody. You got the wrong person. And his last words are, I'm not eloquent. I don't know how to talk. I'm slow of speech. Send somebody else. Jeremiah's excuse was he was too young. There's probably several things in that. It's not just that he's too young, but it's that he doesn't have the experience. He doesn't have the training to be a confident speaker. He probably won't have respect of elders and leaders. And that's all true. He's young. He, anywhere from 17 to 30. Still considered young. It was all true, but nevertheless, it was still just an excuse. And when God calls us to be more, more than we are, we all have excuses, don't we? The truth is, if we honestly looked at ourselves, we are all inadequate to the task. Most of us are pretending to be more than we are, and life is often bigger than we are. So we all have excuses. I'm not smart enough, I'm not energetic enough, I'm too young, I'm too old, I haven't got enough training. We have our moments, we have moments of greatness, but most of the time things just seem too big for us. And if we were ruth ruthlessly honest with ourselves, when God calls us to something, we often feel like there's a huge gap between what we think we are able to do and what God actually calls us to. And that there is always a reason for us to be able to say, I can't do that. Too old, I'm too young, 
too dumb, I haven't got the experience, I'm too tired, too busy, can't talk good, I haven't got much, I can't do it. But if we are honest again with ourselves, we'll probably admit that our excuses are only a camouflage for our fears. Our excuses are usually just ways to hide what we fear and the fact that we are afraid. God says to Jeremiah, don't say you're too young. Go to the people I'm going to send you to. Whatever I say to you, you tell them, do not be afraid of them. God saw right through Jeremiah's excuse to what the real issue was. You're afraid, Jeremiah. Do not be afraid of them. Who's Jeremiah afraid of? Well, probably just about everybody, I think. Through his ministry, he is going to talk to kings and rulers and authorities, to priests, but also to all the people. Kings and rulers, chief priests, they can be intimidating. They have the power to hurt you. In fact, some of them do hurt Jeremiah. How do you talk to them? And all the people, well... Crowds have a way of getting out of control if, they, if you say something they don't like. And Jeremiah is going to have some hard things to say in his ministry. Look what God tells him. He says uh, in a couple of verses later, I'm appointing you to nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down and to destroy and to overthrow and to build and to plant. Six words, four of them pretty negative. Uproot, tear down, destroy, overthrow. For much of Jeremiah's ministry, he will preach gloom and doom. And then the destruction will come, and he will begin to preach words of hope and building and planting. But those early days, he is being called upon to confront people and correct people. To tell them over and over the bad things that are going to happen, and, and it's their fault that this is happening. It's because of their sin and their rebellion. I think Jeremiah was afraid of that ministry. He was afraid of the people. He was afraid of rejection. He was afraid of pain and suffering. Aren't we all like that? Afraid of failure. Fear of embarrassment. Fear of rejection. Afraid of exposing our own vulnerabilities and weaknesses. This world can be a scary place. And if, it's, and if we're not scared... It's probably because we really don't understand the situation and the dangers that are there. So God listens to Jeremiah's excuse, and he hears Jeremiah's fears, but then he equips Jeremiah for his calling. He equips Jeremiah for what he wants Jeremiah to become and to be. He gives Jeremiah the tools and the things that he needs to be able to do that which he is calling him to. And God does that for us as well. God equips us for what he wants us to be. And we do not need to be afraid of what God calls us to because God is there to equip us for it. It's an old phrase that I hear often. It's a cliche and yet it's kind of too. It's true, sorry. God doesn't call the qualified, He qualifies the call. God doesn't call us because we have all of the abilities. He calls us because He wants us to be available, because we're available. He, call, he, he gives us the qualities He needs in us to be able to do what He wants us to do. If God wants you to do something, if God wants you to say something, He will give you what is needed to accomplish that task or to speak that truth. God equips and empowers us to be who he wants us to be. That's exactly what he did for Jeremiah. Jeremiah wrote, The Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said, I have put my words in your mouth. I'm giving you the words to say, Jeremiah. Don't say that you're too young. Don't say you don't know how to speak. I am giving you the words. Hasn't got anything to do with your experience or your credentials, Jeremiah. I will equip you. My job, the Lord says, is to give you the words, Jeremiah. Your job is to simply speak them. And you do not need to be afraid, he says, because I am with you. 
I will rescue you, he says. God knows Jeremiah's fears. God knows Jeremiah's weaknesses. God has called Jeremiah, and so God equips Jeremiah. And he equips us as well. He helps us be who he wants us to be. God actually equips Jeremiah through visions, two visions. He gives him two visions, two visual reminders that will strengthen him, that will help him overcome his fears. Two visions that will challenge his fears and challenge him to not be afraid. And there are actually two very common sights. These are two visions of two things that he will see through his whole lifetime. So he will never forget what God has called him to and how God will help him overcome his fears. The Lord asks, what do you see, Jeremiah? And the first thing he says he sees is an almond branch. I see an almond branch. In Palestine, the almond tree is kind of the first tree to bloom in the spring. In Anoth, where Jeremiah was from, almond trees were everywhere. It's, one of, it's kind of the almond tree capital of Palestine. And in the early spring, while the air still kind of has the chill of winter and the frost still glistens in the grass, the beautiful blossoms of the almond begin to burst open with that promise of spring to come. And Elle came by the other day, uh, the study the other day with uh, bulb sale, Vessi seeds, but these are the winter bulbs, the tulips and the daffodils and the crocuses. And every spring when you see those little flowers, those little bits of green start to poke up through the frozen ground, through even the bits of snow, you know that spring is coming, that birds will soon return, that leaves will soon fill the trees, that blossoms will begin to transform into the fruits that we pick even now. I see an almond branch, Jeremiah said. Yes, God said. I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled. God was addressing one of Jeremiah's biggest fears. What if I say something, says Jeremiah, or thinks Jeremiah? What if I say something is going to happen and then it doesn't happen? What if I promise God is going to do this and then you don't do it? God, big things are coming. What if you're not strong enough, powerful enough to do what I'm trying to tell people you're going to do? The Babylonians are coming. The largest army ever seen in Israelite history. What if God is not enough to face what has to be faced? You ever wondered if God is really big enough? Or maybe just does God care enough? That I, can I really trust God's word that he will fulfill it as he says he will? God says, I am watching to make sure that my word is fulfilled. Essentially, I will do what I say I will do, Jeremiah. I will make every word I give you come true. And God actually uses a pun to make his point. Something is both visual and audible to Jeremiah, so he would never forget it. The word almond and the word watching are almost identical in Hebrew. They're just one level different. What do you see? He says to Jeremiah, Jeremiah says, I see a shakud, an almond branch. Shakud. Every spring for the rest of his life, he would be seeing almond branches. God responds with, I am shoked, watching. What do you see? I see shoked. What are you doing, God? I am shoked, watching my word. Every time Jeremiah would walk into his hometown in the spring, he would remember this for the rest of his life. The sight of a shoked, reminding him that God is shoked watching, fulfilling his word, the sight of an almond, knowing that God does what he says he's going to do. It would be a powerful tool, powerful tool in Jeremiah's belt. And it's something we all need. 
We can't live by faith without somehow at a very deep level having this assurance that God does what he says he will do. To know in our hearts and in our heads that God keeps his promises. That God's words are not just words, that they are promises, and that when God makes a promise, he keeps his promises. Jeremiah was afraid that God was not powerful enough to do what he said, and so God equips him with this image to remind him every day that God will always do what he says he will do. Then a second vision comes, a vision of a boiling pot. God asks this time, what do you see? I see a boiling pot about to tip towards the south from the north. A pot in the north that is about to spew its water all over the south. A pot in the north that is about to destroy me and my hometowns. The Lord says, that's right. I am bringing in disaster from the north. The kings will lay siege to Judah and Jerusalem and destroy the land, and I will judge my people for their wickedness and for their idolatry. This was Jeremiah's fear. The devastation of an invasion, the destruction of his homeland. He didn't need a vision to see that the Babylonians were coming. The Babylonian power had been growing for some time. They had been preparing their forces for quite a while. Everybody knew the Babylonian army was on the move and it was conquering every nation it came to and it was only a matter of time before they parked their army at Judah's doors. So how is this comforting? How is this strengthening? I am bringing disaster, says the Lord. How does this help Jeremiah overcome his fears? Well, two things. First, it's water in a pot. The pot of boiling water. It's not the floods of the Jordan River or the uncontrolled waters of the deluge. It's hot water in a pot. It's cleaning water. It's the water you use to wash your dishes or to wash your hands. It's limited the Lord says, I am sending disaster with a specific purpose. That I am sending the disaster shows that God is still in control. Though the disaster was coming, though the disaster would be awful, it was not all powerful. The enemy was limited. That even in the face of this great enemy, Jeremiah did not need to be afraid because their power was not endless. It was not, it was limited. And the war and the exile would help wash away the idolatry of God's people. It would be a force that would cause the people to focus on what was truly important. What was essential. It would drive the Jewish nation towards faithfulness and towards obedience. Sometimes the things that we fear will come to pass. And we can't hide from them. Denying that an evil or a wrong or an inevitable disaster is not going to come doesn't help. I've heard about the tsunami in the Indonesia, perhaps, in the last few days. One of the saddest things I heard in the news yesterday was that the people were warned about it, but then there was confusion in the message, and they thought, Everything was okay, that it had gone away. And so they gathered on the beaches for a festival. They went to the water's edge to celebrate, not knowing what was coming. We can't ignore or be unaware of the evil in our world. Sometimes the things that we fear are real. Sometimes things do go wrong. You ignore a, a diagnosis, doesn't make the illness disappear. Sometimes we have to live with our eyes open. Sometimes we see a lot of the wrong that is going on in our world. We see things that are going to challenge our faith. We see that it is getting harder and harder, and sometimes it looks like the world is worse. Sometimes personal challenges and difficulties we will have to face. But how do we face them without being overwhelmed? How can we go on without being afraid? 
The vision of Jeremiah gives us the answer that evil is not everything and evil is not everywhere. That problems will have a beginning, but they will also have an end. That the boiling pot is only so big and only so much. And so we can't let our fears intimidate us. That God can even use the challenges, even use those things that we fear to bring about good. Without this vision of the boiling pot, we kind of lose a sense of proportion. If we only ever listen to the news in the world, if we only ever got the world's perspective, we could easily lose hope. But when we see it from God's point of view, it's not nearly so big. Expect after this vision, every time Jeremiah walked into the kitchen, saw a pot of boiling water, every time he washed his dishes, he would remember the lesson of the boiling pot, that the enemy, the evil is there, but it is limited. Jeremiah has these two visions that equip him for life, to face his fears. The first vision to convince him that God always fulfills his word. The second to convince him that though the world is dangerous, the danger is not overwhelming. Evil might be present, but it has its limits. And so equipped, God tells him, go do it. Get on with it. He says, stand up and go and say whatever I tell you to say and don't be afraid. Don't be afraid or I will give you something to be afraid about. Kind of sounds like your mom, doesn't it? God is simply telling Jeremiah, follow my commands, do what I tell you to do, and you will have nothing to fear. Obedience, obedience to God's way, is God's way of helping us have confidence that can dispel our fears. Obedience can overcome fear. You're driving down the highway. Got another highway illustration, I guess. You're driving down the highway, and you're going down the hill this time. You come over the top of the hill, and you're starting to go down the hill. And you look down the hill, and you see in between the highway that there's a car parked in the median. What do you do? Well, if you're driving the speed limit, if you're obeying the limit, you keep going with no fear. But if you're going 150 in a 110 zone, you slam on the brakes, and you Pray for mercy that he didn't see you because you are afraid of that speeding ticket. But if you're obeying and following, there's no fear. And obedience to God can also help us overcome fears. Obedience to God's word and following what we know is God's will. If we always tell the truth, we never have to fear being caught in the lie. If we always deal honestly with people, we never have to fear being accused of cheating or stealing or taking advantage of another. If we treat each other with honor and respect, we need not have to fear that we put someone else down. But if we fail to love our neighbor, if we discriminate against the poor, if we discriminate against the foreign or those who look or speak differently than us, then our fear will not only be that we're out of line with society, but that we're out of the will of God. So the Lord tells Jeremiah, just go and do what I have told you to do, and obedience will overcome your fear. In fact, the Lord says to him, today, I make you a fortified city, an iron pillar, a bronze wall, that you will stand in the midst of it all. Was Jeremiah that strong? Yes, he was. Did he have his weaknesses? He often felt weak. His emotions sometimes got the best of him. He was tired. He was beaten. Sometimes he even got a little depressed. But his faith was always strong. His spirit was always steadfast. His inner life, his relationship with God deepened and was a solid footing for him for his life. Jeremiah was called, but he was a little afraid. So God equips him, gives him what he needs so that he needs not be afraid. And God gives us what we need to be what he wants us to be. God equips us for the things he calls us to do. 
educated by an almond branch. Jeremiah's inner spirit was unflinching. He always could trust in God because he knew that God is powerful and God will do what he says he's going to do. Educated by a, a pot of boiling water, he knew that even though outwardly evil might seem to be overwhelming, it was always limited, that God's power was greater. And equipped by those two visions, Jeremiah was as impregnable as a forest, as immovable as an iron post, as solid as a brown's wall. Just a pretty, which is pretty good for a guy who started out as just a boy. See, Jeremiah learned that you should never underestimate God. Never underestimate the power of God. It's what the almond was all about. Never underestimate the power of God. And never overestimate evil. That's what the boiling pot was all about. Sometimes we do the opposite. Sometimes we think we underestimate God and we overestimate evil. But God's promise to Jeremiah was, you do not need to be afraid. Because I am with you. And I am always with you. Just as for us, the Lord Jesus Christ spoke and said, I am with you always, even to the ends of the earth. Let us pray. Father and God, we thank you this day for your blessings to us. We thank you, Father, for the way that you empower us to do that which you call us to do. Father, we know that you have formed us, you have created us to serve you. You call us to be more even than we are on our own. And you are the one who empowers us to do that. So teach us, Lord, how not to fear and instead to walk confidently with you. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Closing hymn this morning is 405. My faith has found a resting place. It's number 405 in your hymn books, but the words will also be up on the screen. Let's stand together as we sing. My faith has found a resting place, not in device or creed. I trust the ever-living one, his wounds for me shall plead. I need no
In the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, when he said, My peace I give to you, not as the world gives, but as I give. Do not be afraid. Now by the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the grace of God our Father, the love of God our Father, the presence of the Holy Spirit, go with us all. In Jesus' name, amen.